Hey cool words, it's David. So today we're going to do something a little bit different to our usual videos on here. We're going to have more of a conversation with you about a paper of hers that has recently come out. It's been making headlines. It wasn't something we actually really wanted to be making headlines at this moment in time, but it is what it is and we wanted to explain to you what's been going on. So I'll let Alex here, who's the lead author of our paper, sort of give you a quick backstory as, as to what's been happening. Yeah, so uh, David and I have been working on this uh, pretty major moons project for the last couple of years, well since I got here at Columbia uh, as a first year graduate student and uh, what we've been doing is we've been examining a uh, huge population of stars uh, in the Kepler field. Uh, we've taken the highest quality data, the highest quality uh, planets uh, that we have in that collection. It's uh, 284 planets that we've examined in this work and what we did was we were looking for a population of moons in this in this uh, population of this ensemble of of planets in the in the Kepler data, looking for the signal of of moons out there to see are you know are there uh, moons in any uh, great uh, abundance in uh, in the Kepler field, and so we've been working on this paper. Uh, for quite a while, and uh, that's <laughs> time. Yeah, for quite a while, and uh, we're just in uh, about ready to to submit it to uh, to the Astrophysical Journal for for peer review. Uh, in the process of doing this work, uh, we also identified a single exomoon candidate that we felt uh, pretty excited about. Uh, we saw this signal pop out, and we said, well, "Okay, that looks interesting." We start investigating it a little more. Um, and what we do is we run a series of tests to kind of try to rule out the moon candidate. We say, okay, well, it looks like a moon, but could it be this? Could it be that? Uh, and it passed a, a series of our uh, tests to see, you know, could we rule out the presence of a moon? And start, so it started looking uh, uh, pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and so what ultimately did, we did was that we felt this moon candidate looked good enough that we proposed to observe this target uh, with the Hubble uh, Space Telescope uh, and fortunately we were able to get that time. We were awarded uh, a lot of time on, on Hubble to, to observe this target and so we've been planning, uh, I've spent the last uh, month or so or you mm -hmm. know quite a, quite a bit of time planning this observation. Yeah, especially you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the reason by the way we didn't use Kepler again is because Kepler is no longer observing the same field. So we really had no choice but to use another telescope. Like That's Hubble. right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah. So we've been very excited about this candidate. Cautiously optimistic, I would say. Uh, the the key with this data is that uh, we only have three transits. Remember, transits are the little dips in the intensity of starlight that we observe when a planet passes in front of the star. And so, for lots of planets in the Kepler data, we have lots and lots of these transit events. Uh, with this particular planet, we only have three of these transits. Yeah, that's, we, that's rare. I mean, right. normally we yeah we have way more than that. So this is really pushing a uh, 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 comfort zone of, of what we would normally claim to have something in. But it's it is what it is. There's only three events there, so we did the best we could with it. Exactly right. So we we felt pretty good about this, but with only three transits, we said okay, that is really inconclusive, and mm -hmm. so we really require a follow up observation. Uh, with Hubble to, to confirm uh, whether this is actually a moon that we're observing uh, around this star. So we've got the uh, Hubble observation approved and we've been working towards that. Uh, and we're very excited, but uh, it's a, it's sort of a strange turn of events. <laughs> yeah, this is, where, this is where things kind of go off the usual academic rails. Uh, so, you know, we didn't really realize this, but the, um, the Hubble proposal has all become a public document, or at least the phase two, which is sort of the list of scheduled observations. It's a pretty technical, jargony document. It's buried away in the NASA archives. Nobody really would normally notice it, apart from maybe another astronomer. And that's what happened. Another astronomer, I won't say who, but they noticed it. They obviously got excited about it. I don't blame them uh, for being excited about it. And they tweeted it. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, yes, journalists don't monitor maybe the NASA archives, but they do monitor Twitter, and they, they picked, it, picked up on this. And uh, I got a phone call saying, I'd like to interview you about, um, about an exo a possible exomune detection coming out of your group. And I was like, what? Like, how? <laughs> like, where's this coming from? Like, uh, you know, we have this proposal in, but how do you, you know, where's this, where's this, you know, what's the source? And uh, when, we, when we realized it was coming off uh, the, this, I don't know if you call it a leak or what, what you'd really call it, um, we got worried because we didn't have a paper ready yet to, to formally discuss this. Um, obviously, we'd done all these tests for the proposal, um, which you know was good because we could we could reuse that material actually to put into a paper. 
But it, it sort of forced our hand a little bit. You know, we were hoping that we would talk about this object at a time where we knew definitively, conclusively, one way or the other, whether this was a real exomoon. And the reason for that is because I, in, the, in the public, uh, it can be confusing when you hear about an Earth-like planet, for example, that's announced, and then two weeks later, it's no longer there, and then it's back again, and there's this back and forth, and you're, it, it can sometimes erode the public trust, I think, in, in science. With exomoons, you know, as someone who's worked on this for 10 years or something, like, I always wanted exomoons, the first exomoon, to be really clear-cut. Like, people would, would see it and then be like, there was no doubt that when we claimed there was an exomoon there, it was the real thing. That's what I wanted. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of this, the, the way uh, recent events have happened, uh, we, we really felt the only option at this point was to, was to write a quick paper talking about what we had, even though it wasn't conclusive. So yes, it's a candidate, it's not a confirmed signal. And that might be frustrating to you because in a year's time, we might have to tell you this, this moon's not real. You know, that's, it's completely, at this point, maybe 50-50 chance that this moon isn't real. Um, but we have, we have a case that we think is exciting and interesting. We definitely think it's worth while pursuing with the Hubble Space Telescope. That's why we wrote the proposal. Um, it's the best candidate probably we've ever had, but it's not the first one we've ever had. We have had candidates in the past, and I could do a whole uh, video series about all those false positives that have disappeared and how frustrating it's been in the past. But um, it was a it was an interesting experience. It wasn't the ideal way, um, but Alex Alex has been sort of communicating this with a with a blog you wrote recently as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we were fortunate to uh, be given a space in Scientific American to sort of. Uh, lay out our case of why we released this paper because it's very unusual. We really, David and I, and I think most astronomers firmly believe that uh, papers like this really ought not uh, go public until they've been properly vetted, uh, peer-reviewed uh, by a, a qualified referee. Mm -hmm. And so this is very unusual that we're putting out a paper uh, before it's gone through that process. But, you know, we really didn't know what was going to happen uh, when this news came out. And uh, the weird thing about the media is that it can be sort of like a game of telephone where one article gets written and then the second article sort of cribs from the first and the third from the second. It's and Chinese whispers get, <laughs> or something going on. Yeah. Uh, it gets really, uh, can be very distorted. We've seen that happen before. So uh, we wanted to kind of get out in front of it and, and put this paper out so that everybody could see, you know, what we've done and uh, what we're claiming, what we're not, and, and at this point, we, we're making, trying to make it exceedingly clear that, that this is a candidate, and we've, uh, we've done our due diligence on this, on this uh, target, uh, but until we have this Hubble observation, really can't say for sure uh, that, this is a, that this is an exomoon detection. So uh, we put out the paper, and uh, I've sort of laid out our case why we, why we, why we did so, because I think people are, are, are sort of confused uh, why we would uh, sort of, it, you know, it could look like we're jumping the gun here, saying uh, we don't want this uh, uh, to get out there, but we're putting it out there. Uh, yeah. But we just, you know, we kind of wanted to be upfront with everybody about uh, what we've been working on. And we're downplaying it here, you know, a lot, obviously, in this video about, you know, how much you should, you should believe this. But I want to say we are like really excited about this candidate. Um, the reason, you know, the reason why we're we're just being a little bit cautious about it is because it's it would be a Neptune-sized moon. One of uh, Emily Sanford calls it a Nept moon, <laughs> a Nept moon around a super Jupiter-like planet. So when we saw it, we were like, you know, who ordered that? Like that's such a strange. No, there's no theoretical expectation to have moons like that. So. That's you know already a, a pause for thought about the reality of the signal, and then as we said, because we have three transits, it's like you know we can't we can't confirm this really with that with that amount of data. So you know it would be extraordinary. There's no reason physics why you couldn't have a moon like that. It's it's allowed. It's just somewhat surprising to us, given when you look in the solar system, you don't see moons like that. So you know we're we're very excited about the possibility uh, of it, but. Um, you know, if someone, if people keep asking us, like, what would you bet? Like, if, would you bet your, <laughs> Jonas is asking you, like, would you bet your house? Would you bet your car? Would you, what's the level? Of <laughs> I'm not house? a betting man. I don't, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. I don't like going to casinos or anything. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it's really hard to say. I like to say we've, we've, we've done our due diligence. We've, we've done just about everything that we can do uh, to say, okay, this looks like, you know, we're still, we're still in business. Uh, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't really want to bet much of anything one way or the other because the Hubble, the Hubble observation really is critical. Yeah, uh, to, I, I'd, to, I'd say the best language, at least for me, maybe you feel differently, is that 
the signal we have is compatible with a moon, but it doesn't mean it's definitively a moon. It just, it could be at this point. It, it certainly has many of the properties that we might expect an exomoon to induce in a, in a transit light curve. But it's also possible it's just uh, an aberration of, of the noise in an unexpected way that happened in our data set. So um, it'd definitely be excited about this. Um, now the cat's out the bag, I guess we can <laughs> tell you more, more about it in the months to come. Uh, so we've got the, the observations will come up in October 29th. That's right. Is it? Yeah, Hubble's observing October 29th. Um, so from that point, it'll probably take roughly, which say six months. We're going to try to have everything done in six months. That's the proprietary period where the mm. data belongs to us. After which, uh, the data is out there for anybody to dig through. So hopefully, we'll get the paper yeah. out before. <laughs> Makes sense to try and do it in, uh, that, in that time frame for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, so I guess you're looking at maybe a, a year from now before we will really be know. Either way, uh, whether this is a, a real moon, I know that's frustrating, and that's not what we wanted this to come out as. We wanted to tell you about it, yes or no, either way. But maybe it's a good thing. You get to hear about a scientific discovery in action. Uh, I think the cool worlders who watch this channel understand that. But uh, definitely, uh, when you when you see a headline, uh, if you're not used to reading uh, scientific, um, you know, scientific articles, or you're not used to watching videos like this. You might not appreciate that you know there is uncertainty intrinsic to the process of science, and we're definitely still in that uncertain region at, at this point in time. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's a good place to wrap it up. We'll definitely be telling you more about uh, the paper we've put out. The I mean we haven't even talked about this occurrence rate measurement we've made. We've actually measured for the first time the occurrence rate of moons like Jupiter around exoplanets. That was a huge piece of work. That has been completely squashed <laughs> by this headline, and we right. really wanted that to be the headline because we are really proud of that right. that that measurement. It was incredibly difficult to make, mm -hmm. and we think it has really important implications for planet and moon formation theories. So anyway, we'll talk about that in a, in the future. I'm actually about to go away for a couple of weeks, so maybe in a in a late August we'll be uh, putting some videos out um, about this about more about this exo moon paper we've we've got out. Um, it's out the baggie. We'll put a link down below for the paper so you can read it yourself. And um, uh, we're, yeah, fingers crossed. This maybe, this maybe could be the first one, but it also could very well be a ghost in the machine. So yeah, so so, so stay tuned uh, as we put out more about this candidate. Uh, and in the meantime, just uh, stay with us. That it's we're we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, but uh, hold on, and, and we'll see what actually happens with the, the Hubble observation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching, everybody. And uh, until the next video, probably uh, uh, Tiffany Jansen has a video coming very soon about uh, this phase curve measurement um, that she's been working on. We're really excited about that as well. We have a whole bunch of awesome products coming to fruition right now in the Coolers Lab. Um, but definitely this XME one will probably be one you'll be hearing about quite a lot in the media. So stay tuned also to the channel to have more updates about this interesting candidate and our current rate measurement for sure. So until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.